Tesla has a problem. In September 2020, Tesla held a special event called Battery Day. And in this presentation, Elon Musk himself revealed that Tesla was actively developing and manufacturing a revolutionary new 4680 battery cell design that would solve pretty much every problem involved with making electric vehicles. More driving range, significantly lower manufacturing cost, and the ability to continuously scale production volume well into the millions of vehicles. To achieve this, Tesla would have to become one of the largest battery producers on Earth. Three years later, and nearly none of the expectations from Battery Day have been realized, which is a problem, no doubt about that. But is it a problem that Tesla can solve? Let's find out. All right, first, we are going to identify the problem that has been holding Tesla back from achieving their battery day dreams. And then we'll talk about the steps that the company has been taking to reach a solution and get this whole process back on track. Because they are just batteries, right? How hard could it possibly be? The root of the problem is not so much in the battery itself, but it's the changes that Tesla is attempting to bring to the manufacturing and materials that go into the battery. This is the sticking point. All of the viable 4680 cells that Tesla has produced so far are perfectly fine batteries. They're not suffering from performance loss or spontaneous combustion or any of the other problems that are generally associated with bad batteries. The biggest issue has been that Tesla simply can't make enough production-worthy 4680 cells to have any meaningful impact on their vehicle lineup. As it stands, there is only one Tesla vehicle available for purchase with the 4680 battery pack equipped, and it's the weird version of the Model Y that has a lot less range and a little less power than the regular Model Y, yet only sells for about $3,000 less. So that doesn't really make any sense from a consumer standpoint, and it kind of debunks all of the promised benefits for the 4680, which centered around increased range, increased power, and decreased cost of production. Now, the range and the speed are nice to have, but they're not critical, and we're going to address that a little later on. The real bummer here is the cost. The 4680 Model Y is so frustrating because it's still very expensive. You can have a regular Model Y with 330 miles of range for 50490 or you can have a 4680 Model Y with 279 miles of range for 47740 Bit of a problem there. If we were just trying to keep everything proportional in terms of range per dollar, then the lower range Model Y should be around $7,500 cheaper than the longer range Model Y. And the reasonable explanation for this is that the 4680 battery cells are much more expensive than Tesla's standard battery cell because the 4680 is being produced at a much lower volume. Now, we can chart the progress of Tesla's 4680 cell manufacturing over the course of the past year and a half. Beginning on February 18th, 2022, Tesla announces that they have produced 1 million 4680 cells at their pilot line in Fremont, California. Next, on December 25th, 2022, Tesla announces that they have achieved a run rate of 868,000 cells in a seven-day period, and this is with combined production from both Fremont and the newly installed battery line at Giga Texas. On January 25th, 2023, Tesla executive Drew Baglino confirmed that there is one battery production line in operation at Giga Texas, with three more under various stages of commissioning and installation. Then, on June 16th, 2023, Tesla announced 10 million 4680 cells manufactured at Giga Texas. So we can see an obvious improvement here and a very steady increase in production volume. The problem is that these numbers are coming up massively short of the volume that Tesla had predicted only three short years ago. 10 million batteries is a lot of batteries, but when looked at in perspective, that's only around 12,000 Model Y sized battery packs and it's less than one gigawatt hour of energy storage capacity. As far as we know, each of the four battery lines at Giga Texas should have a total capacity of 25 gigawatt hours per year. So we haven't even hit 1 25th of one line after at least six months of production. That sounds like a problem. 
And just to add a little more context, because we're only ordinary people, we don't know about battery production, we don't know how many they're even supposed to be making, but we do know that the Schuler battery cell casing machine that Tesla uses to produce the metal canisters on the 4680 line, that has an advertised capacity of up to 2,000 cases per minute. Which gives us an idea at what the industry standard for a high volume battery cell production line probably looks like. It works out to around 20 million cells per week if you ran the machine nonstop, and that's a hell of a lot faster than Tesla is making 4680 batteries right now. And we can also compare where we are now against our battery day targets that Elon Musk and Drew Baglino outlined in September 2020. Their forecast was for Giga Texas to reach 100 gigawatt hours per year of battery production in 2022, and then carry that on to meet three terawatt hours by 2030. A terawatt is 1,000 gigawatts. On battery day, Elon declared that Terra is the new Giga, and said that this rapid scale-up was essential to meet sustainability goals on an industrial scale. So, as of summer 2023, Giga Texas will need to scale up battery production by over 100 times just to meet their original 2022 energy goal, and then Tesla will need to scale up another 300 times from there to meet their energy quota by the end of the decade. And these are not just numbers that Tesla made up for fun. During the presentation, Elon said specifically that this high volume of in-house battery production is what will allow the company to make a lot of cars, and a lot more stationary storage. In addition, Elon said that the massive drive down in cost per kilowatt hour per battery cell that was being projected at battery day is what Tesla requires in order to finally produce an affordable vehicle. So if these projections don't hold true in the near future, then it could impact Tesla's ability to scale their vehicle production to extreme volumes that are on par with global competitors like Toyota and GM. It could also prevent the company from ever realizing their goal of a compelling electric vehicle that only costs around $25,000. Now that we know all of that, we can start digging into some specific issues that have been preventing the 4680 battery rollout from living up to expectations. The important thing to keep in mind here is that the 4680 itself is not a magic battery cell. It's made up from more or less the same stuff that you'd find in any high-performance EV cell, with the exception of Tesla's promise to eliminate cobalt from the cathode material. But even still, there is very minimal amounts of cobalt used in Tesla's current generation of battery cells. So it's not the biggest deal. There's probably more cobalt in your iPhone than a single Panasonic 2170 cell that you'd find in a Model Y. The secret to the 4680 cost savings was supposed to come from Tesla's unique and novel manufacturing process, which is actually kind of magic. The biggest difference between the way a 4680 cell is made as compared to a traditional cell is called the dry electrode process versus the traditional wet process. So, what the hell does that mean? Well, we've got two sides of your battery, the cathode and the anode, also known as the positive and negative electrodes. Each of these electrodes starts out as a thin sheet of metal foil. The cathode is aluminum foil and the anode is copper foil, and then there is a layer of active material applied to each foil sheet. This is a ground up powder of various elements that determine the battery function. On the anode side, this active layer is almost always graphite, and that's sometimes mixed with a small amount of silicon. The cathode side varies depending on the style of battery, but in a high-performance EV cell like the 4680, there's going to be a large amount of nickel combined with some manganese, and you may or may not find a bit of cobalt in there as well. The wet or dry process comes in when you need to convince these powders to adhere to your cathode and anode sheets in extremely thin, even, and consistent layers. In order to make that happen, you need to introduce a binder. In the wet process, a liquid solvent is used that allows the binder to penetrate the mixture and wrap around the active particles like a glue. Then the electrode sheet is dried to evaporate the liquid solvent and leave behind a solidified layer of active material. Sounds easy enough, and it kinda is. This is how you make batteries in 99% of all applications, but it also means that you have to deal with all of this liquid solvent on the production floor, and you have to have specific equipment dedicated to wetting the electrode and then drying the electrode after. 
On the other hand, a dry electrode process relies on something called fibrilized binder particles. This means that the particles have been stretched out long and thin like fibers, and the idea is that when the active material is combined with this binder under the right combination of heat and pressure, these fibrilized particles will wrap around the active material and bind it together into a cohesive mass. So this dry process is obviously preferable because instead of the whole wetting and drying thing, you can go straight from a powder to an electrode. But the thing is, if this were easy to achieve, then everyone would be doing it, and they're not. In fact, there is only one company in the world that figured out how to effectively create a dry electrode process. And it wasn't Tesla, this was Maxwell Technologies, a company that was subsequently bought by Tesla in 2019. Elon talked a bit about this at a Tesla investor event in March. He said, we acquired Maxwell really just for the dry electro technology, but this just illustrates what a gigantic gap there is between something working at a small scale and at large scale. Elon went on to simply state, the dry electrode problem is really quite a hard problem. What he's referring to is this ongoing issue with Tesla's 4680 production, where they've only been able to successfully produce the anode side of the battery with the dry electrode process, and as far as we know, they have yet to be successful in producing a dry cathode. So that means they still need the solvent and whole wetting and drying rig on the production floor, and this means that Tesla is not actually realizing the majority of the cost savings that was promised with the 4680 at battery day. And not only that, even with the successful anode process, there have still been significant difficulties with achieving consistent results. One of the biggest issues that is interfering with the dry process is that it often results in a thicker electrode with more binder particles present in the mix. This means less active material and therefore less energy density. Also, because the dry binder and the active material have to be pressed together under such high pressure to activate those fibrilized particles, that exerts a lot of shearing force on the mixture. This can actually cause damage to the anode material, the particles of active battery material can break apart, fuse together, or become chemically altered in the process. This leads to a subpar electrode that has to be scrapped and made again, which further increases production cost. And this issue with shearing force is most likely the reason that Tesla is not using the dry process for the cathode side of their battery. According to lab tests of the first production 4680s, the anode side of the battery is a dry process pure graphite electrode. So when you see videos of the Tesla battery production lines, these are the long black strips moving through the machines. What's interesting there is that Tesla has made the deliberate choice to not include any silicon in their anode material. All of the previous 2170 and 18650 cells that have been used in Tesla vehicles have been mostly graphite with a small amount of silicon mixed in. This allows for higher energy density and faster charging rates. So the absence of silicon in the 4680 more than likely would have something to do with the silicon particles getting damaged in the dry electrode process. And by that same reasoning, we'd have a pretty good answer why Tesla isn't making dry cathodes. That side of the battery requires all of those volatile metal oxides, the nickel, cobalt, and manganese, these likely have an even more difficult time holding up to the shearing force exerted by the dry coating process. Now, that doesn't mean that Tesla has given up. At the March 2023 Investor Day, Tesla's senior VP of powertrain development, Drew Baglino, specified, we haven't stalled out yet on the rate of progress either. That's both on the anode and the cathode side. So the key takeaway here is that Tesla knows they have a problem and they are consistently working on solving it. But they haven't quite gotten there yet, so stay tuned. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That is so important for getting our content out to more people. If you enjoy the content, then you'd probably also enjoy our weekly newsletter, so sign up with the link down below at theteslaspace.com. A huge thank you to all of our Patreon supporters who are listed on the screen now. You help us make the best content we can, and we really appreciate it. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.